Hello, I'm Claire Freeman, Director of the Natural History Society of Northumbria. Welcome to this week's talk, one in a series of NHSN's Winter Nature Talks programme. As a society, we've been sharing talks since the year we were founded in 1829. And in those early years, many people would have been isolated in their pursuit of natural history. So over those 191 years since, we have been bringing people together to hear about the latest discoveries and environmental findings. This year, digital technology, we hope, will enable us to share the talks with many more people to inspire them to care for and protect nature. Please do visit our website to find out more about NHSN and also you might like to keep in touch with us for news about North East Nature. I now hand over to one of my colleagues who will introduce this week's speakers and I hope you enjoy the talks. Hello, my name is Gordon Port and I'm one of the volunteers with the Natural History Society of Northumbria. I'm also the section lead on invertebrates so I spend a lot of time looking around at uh, things that creep and crawl around us and this year because I've been stuck at home much more like a lot of us I've become much better at noting those records and actually submitting them. One reason that I've been particularly uh, practicing my recording is because I've been involved in the Northeast bee hunt. Now the speaker on this talk is Ryan Clark who's going to be talking to us about biological recording. Ryan is currently based in the Northeast, but he's working remotely as many of us are. He's a monitoring and research officer for the Wildlife Trust for Bedfordshire, Cambridgeshire, and Northamptonshire. And his interests quite sensibly span insects, but he also dabbles in other groups as well, such as flowering plants as mosses. So Ryan's talk is called Dots on the Map, an Introduction to Biological Recording. Over to you, Ryan. Good evening everyone, I'm Ryan. Thank you to NHSM for inviting me here this evening to talk to you about the fascinating world of biological recording. Firstly, a little bit about myself. I've been recording wildlife for the last 10 years. I grew up on the edge of the Chilterns in Buckinghamshire and started to notice the wildlife in my garden and making lists of the species that I found there. This grew into a, a passion for the species that, that were often overlooked. My interests are wide ranging, but they include bees and wasps, flowering plants, beetles, and mottos and liverworts. To me, biological recording brings these all together by learning more about these species and making a difference by submitting records of where these species are found. So this evening I'm going to guide you through these topics. Firstly we're going to look at what biological recording actually is, then we're going to look at why we record wildlife, and then finally I'm going to talk to you about how you can get involved and submit records of your own sightings. So you might be thinking what is biological recording anyway? So biological recording is defined as a scientific study of the distribution of living organisms. This all sounds rather complicated, but it's actually rather simple. Bio biological recording is the process of generating biological records. And biological records are made up of four essential pieces of information. The first piece is who. So this is the name of the person that went out and saw the species. The second is what, so that is the species that you've found. The third piece is where, so this is whereabouts you saw the species. And the fourth is when, and this is the date that you saw the species. And I'll guide you through how we um, generate these pieces of information later on. These really are the building blocks of evidence-based conservation, and hopefully throughout this evening you'll, you'll um, see why. Biological recording has a long history in Britain. It is thought to have started around the 17th century with John Ray and Robert Plot. One famous example of biological recording is Gilbert White's 1789 classic, The Natural History and Antiquities of Selborne. 
slightly later on in the Victorian era, we see examples of um, types of biological recording where the Victorians went out and collected flowers and pressed them, they collected butterflies and also documented the wildlife found in their parishes. All of these things now contain really useful information to be able to compare with present day distributions. One local example from the northeast is this example on the right here in Mr Winch's flora of Northumberland. Here we can see that Mr Winch had seen um, seaside sentry in 1804 on at Linda's farm and this was published in his flora of Northumberland which was published in the transactions of the society and this contains really useful information about the species, how he went about identifying it. And this species is still present today. And I've actually seen it on Linda's farm. The way that biological records are documented has changed over time as well. So originally they were published in papers such as this or shared between different people in the form of letters. But now there's a pushed towards online recording, which is much faster and allows records to be shared more readily. Next, I'm going to talk to you about the uses of biological records. And hopefully you'll see that they're more than just dots on a map. This is all based on the fact that we need to know what species we're seeing. And I really agree here that the beginning of wisdom is to call things by their proper name and Taxonomy allows us to define which species we're seeing and make comparisons between them. Biological records and recorders have never been more important. We can answer all these questions and more, and you'll see this this evening. So we can see which species are found where. We can look at which habitats they're found in, how their distributions might change in the future, due to things such as climate change. We can also look at the timing of life history events, the phenology of species. So we can look at when certain plant species are flowering, when certain insects are emerging, and how might this change year on year. We can also look at how populations are changing. And lastly, we can look at which species might colonise better next, and how this might affect our species that we already have here and affect things like our agriculture. It's also a really exciting time to be recording wildlife. Technology is making it a lot more easy to be able to share your sightings and identify species. Online recording, as I mentioned earlier and we'll mention later on as well, has really revolutionised the way that we can record wildlife. These records can be generated once and used for hundreds of different uses. There are also really good resources out there now online and in books to be able to help you to identify the species and share your sightings with others. And also DNA is helping us to be able to define what species we're actually seeing. And this will only become more important. Biological recording in the UK is worth a lot of money in terms of the data that it generates. Most of the data is generated by unpaid amateurs that just go out there and make lists of the species that they're seeing. And seven and a half million hours of this volunteer go time go into monitoring the wildlife in, in the UK every year, which is amazing. One of the most simple ways that biological records is, are used is to look at the distribution of species. So on the right hand side here, you can see the distribution of the Southern Marsh Orchid and the Northern Marsh Orchid. And here you can obviously see that the Southern Marsh Orchid has more southerly distribution and the Northern Marsh Orchid has a more northerly distribution, although there is some overlap. So this is telling you which species are found where, which is really important. Another example of this is the Northeast Bee Hunt, which is where citizen scientists have generated records of the bees found in the northeast and helped to increase the knowledge of the species found in the area. We can also look at how, these, how the distribution of species is changing over time. 
So, for example, on the left here, we have a map of the yellow hammer distribution from the um, 2007 to 2011 BTO atlas. So we can see that the yellow hammer is present in most of Britain, but in some areas the, where you can see the, the black downward pointing triangles has been lost between the periods of 1981 to 1984 and 2007 to 2011. But there have also been some gains in some areas such as the southwest where the species is now colonized or been recorded for the first time at least. On the right hand side we can see the distribution of the comma butterfly this is taken from the state of Britain's butterflies. Here we can see the first time that the comma butterfly was recorded in the area. So you can see for most of the southern half of Britain this butterfly was present in the period 1970 to 1982 and wasn't present further north, whereas now the comma butterfly has now moved northwards and is fairly common in some areas of the northeast. Using these biological records, we can also look at how distributions of species might change in the future. So one example here is Bombus lapidarius, the red-tailed bumblebee, shown here on the right. By using biological records, we can work out the climatic niche of the species, the area that it can live in due to the climate. And we can see here that on the left-hand side, under one climate, change, climate change prediction, the species is thought to have been lost from the southwest by 2050 and lost by most of southern and central England by 2100 under these climate change predictions. So while this is really worrying it can also help to inform conservation and think about how we can allow these species to be able to survive in these areas still and also to be able to move northwards throughout the landscape. These distribution maps are also really powerful when they're brought together into national atlases. So these again allow us to map out the distributions of species and also assess trends over individual species and also different groups of species as a whole. And see how the species such as the water beetles are faring on as a whole together. More than 10,000 species in Britain are now covered in these printed atlases and many other atlas maps are also online which allows them to be updated um, more continuously and give us really accurate distribution maps of the species. And they can be repeated really easily now using computer programs. Records can also tell us about the status of species both locally and nationally. Some examples here show the mammals, amphibians and reptiles of the northeast, which tells us about the status of these species in, in the area. Others such as the vascular plant red list for England bring together all of the records for England for flowering plants and tell us about which species are faring better than others. And they also range to more technical publications such as this review here of the status of the um, stag beetles, door beetles and dung beetles of Great Britain. Here this gives us the hard facts about which species are doing well and which species aren't doing so well. This is incredibly powerful because the criteria used here are the same across all sorts of different taxonomic groups, whether they're beetles, plants or fungi or whatever they could be. This means that we can compare species across different groups and put this information to the government and say these species are regionally extinct or endangered or whatever they may be and in the hope that this scientific hard facts will make them listen some more. But the local status reviews are also incredibly important. They can highlight local priorities and changes at a local level as, and these are often the canary in the mind to changes at a more national level. They also highlight the gaps in the data that we have. 
and help us to target our recording better so that we can fill in some of these gaps and gain a better picture of the species in the area. We can also look at the trends of species, such as those shown in the State of Nature report, published in 2019 and also published several times before that. Many of you may have read the State of Nature report, but might not realise that it's based on virtual records alongside standardised monitoring, such as those found in butterfly transects and bird transects, etc. So these use a process called occupancy modelling, where we can look at where species have been found and where species should be but might not have been found yet. And this allows us to look at the trends of species and where they've been lost from areas. And put this in front of the government again and show the trends in our species. This is based on records, so and it can only be done for species where we have enough data and enough knowledge about their ecology and what they're doing and how they're faring to a certain extent to be able to look at the facts behind this. The figures here aren't really important in themselves, but they're just to show you here that these records are feeding into really important publications. Also, knowing what species are found on a site is really important if you're managing a nature reserve or a local wildlife site, etc. They tell you how important that site is. And also records can help you to identify species assemblages by seeing which groups of species are found on a site. They can be used to check targets about which species are doing well and which species aren't doing so well. And they also highlight site-based gaps in recording effort. So if someone hasn't come there and recorded your mosses, but you think the site might be really important for mosses, you can, you know, it finds these gaps in, in your data. And without this data, we can't really um, sub, you know, defend and protect these sites, such as local wildlife sites where they sometimes don't have the protection that they deserve. These biological records can help to protect these sites by proving which species are found there. Also, I find it really amazing to be able to see which species I've seen when and where. And I know lots of other people do as well. These these species records aren't just dots on a map, they are an interaction where I've been out and seen a species and often have really strong memories associated with them. It's also a way of learning more about the species, seeing where you've found them and learning about their ecology as well as their distribution and making a significant difference to be able to protect these species. It also can be really social going out with other people and seeing which species you can find and learning about different groups from experts. Next, I'm going to talk to you about how you go about submitting biological records. As I mentioned earlier, there are four main parts to a biological record. Each one of these parts is essential to be able to have a complete biological record. So the first part is who the name of the person has been out there and seen the species. The second is what? So this is a species that you've seen and this obviously needs to be as accurate as possible. The third factor is where? So this is the name of the site and also the grid reference to an appropriate level of detail. And there are lots of resources out there to be able to help you generate the grid reference you don't have to just be able to read them off a map anymore. They have lots of online resources that can help. And online recording can also make this a lot easier for you, as you'll see later. The fourth key part is when. So this is the date that you saw the species. And this is really important to be able to track changes in when species are emerging, such as how dragonflies are shifting their flight periods to, be, to fly sooner in the year, things like that. So they were the four key parts, but basically the more information that you can contain with your record, the better. So an indication of how abundant the species was is really useful. 
the sex of the species if you're seeing males or females. This is really useful to include as well. Or say the stage, say if you're seeing nymphs of a species or adults of an, in, of an insect species. This is really important to include because they have different life histories. If you're recording plants, you can record whether they're in flower or not, or whether they're in fruit. This is also really handy. The determiner is the person that helps you identify the species. So if you get help, you should include the determiner's name, and this is the person that identified the species for you. If you have any evidence of the species, such as if you've got a specimen or a photograph of the species, this is all really important and helps to back up the record. And lastly, how. If you are taking part in some sort of standardised monitoring, such as running a moth trap or using a sweep net, whatever it may be, this is all really important information to include. As more biological records are being generated, data quality becomes ever more important to make sure that we have really credible records to be able to base our science on. So records go through a two-stage process to be able to check that they are likely to be as correct as possible. Firstly, they go through a process called validation. This simply checks that the record is complete and has at least those four key constituent parts. It also checks that the grid reference matches up with the location and things like that. The second stage is verification. This is carried out by experts in, that, in those species groups and they check that the record is likely to be correct based on current knowledge about that species. This all may sound a bit scary, but it's not really. These people are here to be able to help people identify species and they're really happy to hear from people that are interested in their groups. Record flow is really important to think about as well. There are lots of people out there, as you'd have seen earlier, that would like to use your records. Local record centres use the records to be able to go into planning applications to see which where wildlife is found in the local area and to be able to check that development is not going to be negatively affecting these species. But so these local record centres have that local knowledge. But the expertise about the species is also is often sorry in the national recording schemes. So these are the species experts that um, for example on the, on the left here in the middle you can see the Bees, Wasps and Ants Recording Society logo. So they are the experts in Bees, Wasps and Ants and have the knowledge about these species. Everyone wants these records and it's often very difficult to be able to know where to submit your records. But hopefully this is becoming more clear with online recording. But it's definitely not simple. But the key thing is that out of your records you want to be able to see the species, submit your record and by sending in that record and these records being amalgamated together analysed and basically funding, funneling back into conservation so you can see more wildlife on the ground and make a difference by submitting your records. There are many different ways you can submit your records. You can submit them de directly to Eric Northeast, your local environmental record centre, who can help you with biological recording and will be really happy to hear from people that want to get involved with recording wildlife. So they have an online portal, which is really simple to use and be able to submit your records that way. But you can also use spreadsheets or submit records by email or even on paper still to some recording schemes and local record centres. And there are also specialist recording packages containing database software that you can record your sightings on. But for me, the most simple way is to put records onto this, pro this website called iRecord. This is a website that allows you to keep track of your records and to also view the records of other people. These records are then available to local record centres and to national recording schemes. So they can be verified by the national recording schemes and the experts in that group. 
and be passed on to local record centres where they can make a difference locally. This website is free and it's quick and easy to use. As you can see here, there are just two pages in which you can you have to fill out to submit your records. It guides you through your record, making sure that you put in the correctly spelt species name and who identified it. And you can also attach photos here. You can also um, get it to find a grid reference for the site by clicking on the map and zooming in on the area that you saw the species. So you don't have to work about, worry about finding the grid reference to the site because it can help you find that. There are now over 7 million records on iRecords and over 700 registered verifiers there to check the quality of the data. So this is becoming really a really important way to submit records and get them to the people who need to use them and make a difference to conservation. So to summarise, biological recording is a powerful way to help conserve wildlife. Anyone can get involved, you really don't have to be an expert, and anyone submitting records can make a huge difference. It's also a really fun way to keep track of the species you see when you're out on the bound. I'd like to thank you for listening to my talk this evening. If you do have any questions, please feel free to drop me an email or drop me a tweet. Thank you for listening and thank you to NHSN for inviting me here to talk to you. Thank you, Ryan. That was really helpful and hopefully it's going to inspire more of us to get out and get involved with biological recording. And thanks also for providing a trail for the Northeast Bee Hunt, which is going to be the subject of one of the other talks in this series. So thank you very much indeed.